How's it going guys? So I promised Larry Hall I would do a video with regards to my Indian blue worms and today I'm just doing a really quick um, I'm not sure if that's a quarter of a gallon or one eighth of a gallon harvest uh, just so I could do this video so my primary worm which I use in my compost bin is the Indian blue worm which we have a little escapee here oh, look at him go so the Indian blue worm oh look at him go look at him go the Indian blue worm is also known as the Malaysian blue worm as well as the traveling worm its Latin name means um or is Perionix excavatus I'm assuming that means some type of traveling worm or excavating worm or something of that nature. But their origins are thought to be somewhere in the Himalayas. And they are commonly found throughout subtropical and tropical regions. So places like India, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Australia. Uh, with regards to the United States, they are usually found south of the Mason-Dixie line. And um, in the Gulf region, with regards to Hawaii, uh, as you can see, we have a local population, but we are not sure how they got here. There's another guy right here. So, ideal conditions for this worm. As I stated, they like subtropical and tropical regions with temperatures sorry if it keeps going in and out of focus guys with temperatures that range from oh about 75 to 80 degrees is their ideal or excuse me 70 to 80 degrees is their ideal 70 to 80 degrees fahrenheit is their ideal uh, temperature range but they can survive as low as 45 degrees fahrenheit and as high as about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, but with regards to uh, reproduction and just basic basic uh, climate preference, they do best in 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the average length of a worm is about, in its natural state or un when it's not stretched out, is about one and a half to two and a half inches long. So it's actually smaller than a red wiggler but as you can see it when it stretches its body out to uh, to pull itself across whatever medium it's crawling on uh, it can get upwards of they actually get I've seen some in my bin that are probably almost eight inches long so when they're stretched out so they can look quite big but they're actually just a very small worm now with regards to reproduction rates if given the ideal climates and conditions and environments they will usually produce about 20 worms a week and like all other worms that I know about they are hermaphrodites but require another worm to basically um, to form a cocoon around several fertilized eggs and these eggs usually take about two to three weeks to hatch and here's a shot of what the eggs look like Hopefully we can get that to focus so yes the eggs you see in front of you were actually I've been ha harvesting these in small handfuls and this is this is the finished pile that I harvested and this came from just one handful of so basically a pile that size so they are very prolific breeders and they produce a lot of cocoons and a lot of worms so as I said they these eggs hatch within two to three weeks and the worms themselves reach sexual maturity within uh, about three to five weeks but let's say four weeks to be on the safe side so in a month they reach sexual maturity 
like most good composting worms, these worms can usually eat half their body weight in one day. And as you can see with my pile, this is some beautiful, beautiful castings. It's there is still some coconut core fibers uh, present, but take into account that this is what it looks like now. And I started with five gallons of pure coconut core. So, does it? Are they great composting worms? I, I think so. Being that here in Hawaii, we can't import worms such as the African Nightcrawler or European Nightcrawler or anything of that nature. We're stuck with what we got. So, if you live in Hawaii or in a subtropical or tropical region that allows you to have these worms because they're already present, I suggest you get some because it's pretty evident that these guys are composting machines I mean look at the quality of these castings it's beautiful beautiful stuff so that's the benefits um, they, they're prolific breeders so you have a ton of worms in no time if they're in ideal conditions they're great for composting I mean look at this beautiful stuff and they're fairly easy to take care of. The, the good thing about them is that unlike, say, the Alabama Jumper, which can only eat carbon sources, these guys will eat anything. Leaves, well, not anything, but anything uh, a general composting worm will eat, only they'll do it faster. So they're far more effective and efficient than, say, a red wiggler. So that's the benefit of having them now. A problem with them is exactly what I. Uh, a problem with them is with regards to their climate tolerance, which is where the red wiggler might be more effective to have in, say, colder climates. They do not respond well to cold. Um, all it stated in research that they can survive in temperatures as low as 45. I would not allow them to probably get or be in a climate that's lower than possibly. 65 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit that's that's really pushing it uh, I mean I'm from Hawaii so we're acclimated to tropical weather so anything below 70 degrees Fahrenheit can be quite cold to us so I can only imagine what it feels like to the worms the biggest problem with the Indian blue is that as I've addressed in my last worm bin video, they are known as the ninja worm. If there is a way to escape, they will escape if they do not like the conditions of the bin. So as you know, I built a new worm bin to basically allow me to keep uh, in excess of a thousand worms in one, in one bin because you know these guys they work well together so um, I thought my new design was impervious to escape but over the past week um, we had some heavy rain and whatnot and I want to say about five days ago I came out and all these worms were actually or not all of them but I want to say about 20 to 50 of them were all corralled up here under this burlap bag, which I use just to give it uh, shield it from the light and just give it some allow it to aerate. When I lifted this up, because I usually check on the status of my if they're eating or not at night, we had about 20 to 50 worms just corralled right in this area, and I couldn't wrap my mind about, my my mind around it how they could have escaped. So what I'm thinking is see in here they crawled up the wall and when they I've noticed when they crawl they have some type of slimy uh, liquid that they excrete from their body and I'm thinking they were able to actually stick to the ceiling of the wall and crawl out so from under here and crawl out on top so what I did was I tried putting a screen to shield them in but then they 
then I didn't have any problems for the next few days and you know what I said I removed the screen so I just made a makeshift screen with uh, some duct tape as you can see here well I came out last night and actually I came out last night to check on them and we had some uh, hit some rain again actually it it didn't even get into the bin but if you can see these bucket marks here there were about a hundred of them all adult size corralled around this bucket uh, there was liquid around the bucket so I'm not sure if the bin is a little bit too dry right now but they were just corralled around the bucket and I couldn't wrap my mind of how they got out and then the way I check and what I found out was at night uh, I'm not sure if you can see these little or little like water marks here and these are all believe it or not from the worms so I'm not sure if they're only crawling out of the top or if they're also crawling out of the bottom I do have some uh, water holes drilled in the bottom of this bin so I'm going to improve the design and I'll make a video about that at a later time so back to the worms that is probably their major the major problem with raising this worm is that see what I mean look at that making a run for it so um, if if you don't have an airtight bin or an escape proof bin these guys will escape and um, it cost me about a hundred dollars for a thousand worms which is a good price for Hawaii but you know that's that's a lot of money wasted granted they do propagate quite efficiently and effectively but you still have to wait until those worms are mature in age in order for them to you know start really composting material and making more babies so yeah so basically that's the Indian blue worm uh, with regards to my future plans I'm hoping to depending on the number of worms I have I'm hoping to make uh, maybe one or two more bins so I have two to three bins in my worm casting system just so I can start propagating more of them and uh, quite possibly selling the castings um, with regards to actually selling the worms I, I really respected what Zach at Eva Blue Worms did for me and being that you know that is his primary market uh, I don't feel right selling my worms so I, I basically told him you know if I might sell my castings but I respect his business and and I, I wouldn't try and encroach on basically what his market is which is selling these worms because he provides an excellent service uh, with regards to selling worm castings worms and other things like rabbits which uh, which form a great great composting material so if anyone in Hawaii is interested in buying Indian blue worms please uh, check out Zach at Eva Blue Worms great guy very knowledgeable and he provides great service so and other other future plans I have with regards to my worms as you saw with the bin I'm gonna make some improvements and film film the process I'm, I'm thinking of somehow uh, incorporating a removable screen maybe with some velcro and uh, for the bottom hole vents Okay, another problem I saw with the hole vents. So I, I drilled really small holes because I didn't want them escaping. But what I noticed was that the holes were so small that the castings actually clogged them up. So one day I went to actually saturate the soil a lot. And that's what I forgot to mention. The first time they tried to escape was after a heavy soaking with a watering can just to you know because I thought the bin was a little bit too dry and when they escaped again yesterday what I noticed was as I dug down into the bin the bottom was really really heavily saturated with soil so much so that it almost felt like it was uh, pooling at the bottom and what I found out was that the air holes at the bottom 
had become clogged with castings and the water wasn't able to escape as effectively. So what I'm planning to do is possibly creating a separation layer that will allow the water to basically pass through whatever medium I have that's separating the bottom of the bin and the air holes from the castings. And this will basically allow the water to drip down but at the same time hold back the castings and hopefully prevent the worms from coming through. I still need to figure that out as I told as I, I explained because or I still need to figure that out because as you've seen and as I've explained these guys will find a way to escape and I don't want them escaping to the bottom of the bin and drowning. So So yeah, that's basically the video. Hope you guys uh enjoyed it. And especially you Larry, hope you Hope this uh, fulfilled your desire to learn more about more egg. Uh, hope it fulfilled your desire to learn about these worms. If anyone has uh, any questions or comments, or anyone has any questions, feel free to send me a message and don't forget to comment and subscribe below. All right, guys, thanks.